Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Turnstile Tours online program. Uh, my name is Brian Hoffman, and I'm a tour guide and uh, program host here at Turnstile Tours. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, today, we are going to get a very special peek inside a facility that many people don't realize exists uh, and provides a really amazing community uh, and gathering space for uh, artists and canners. And today we're gonna to be chatting with the executive director, uh, Ryan Castalia of Sure We Can in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we'll talk all about what goes on there. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Hi, Brian, thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks so much for, for joining us today. It's really a pleasure. Uh, now you, I guess, are in the office uh, in Sure We Can at the moment. That's right, I'm here in the office and we'll be going around the, uh, the broader space itself in just a bit. Thank you, really exciting. Thank you so much. Um, and so you and I, we connected because of Sean Bazinski, uh, who previous viewers of our programs may know Sean. Sean was the founder, is the founder of the Street Vendor Project, who uh, an organization that supports, protects and provides a community for street vendors. And we uh, discussed them on some of our in-person tours as well. So there's a lot of similarities actually between their organi that organization and Sean's actually on the board of Sure We Can as well. So, so tell us a little bit about how you guys provide a community for canners and, and what that community looks like and, and, and what it is for those that don't know. Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, first, let me give a big shout out to Sean and Street Vendors Project, um, such good friends of ours and really doing some really extraordinary work. I know they're involved in a big fight right now um, to get more conducive licensing setups with the city. I mean, especially in the pandemic, street vendors are really suffering. So I encourage everyone who's watching right now to check them out and uh, give them also the support you can. Um, so uh, canners, that's really where the story starts. Um, canners are a type of waste picker, which is a term that gets used all around the world for people who make their living on what most people, let's say, would view as waste or discard. Um, so in other countries, not America, this often looks like people who live and work around waste sites, dumps, let's say, and, and landfills, um, scavenging and repurposing things. Um, in America, where the situation is a little bit more regulated, that kind of work around waste sites is not permitted on the same level as in other countries. Um, work by waste pickers is largely structured under bottle bills. Um, New York has one. And it, what that means is that on certain types of uh, beverages that have certain types of containers, namely containers made out of metal, glass, or plastic, a small deposit is placed on those containers, which is charged to the customer when they purchase it, and then can be redeemed by returning that container to uh, the, its originator. So that can mean the grocery store where you bought it, or in the case of redemption centers that do this on a larger scale, that means returning it to the distributors who brought it to those stores in the first place. Because um, here in New York, most people, like your average person, uh, doesn't do that sort of redemption on their own, these bottles and cans end up in the waste stream. So they're littered on the street or they're put into trash or recycling, what have you. And um, the essentially, because that deposit value is still there, it's as if someone were just throwing nickels, since the value is five cents in New York, into the waste stream. So canners are those individuals who, uh, through whatever circumstances, are invested in uh, making some use out of that income. So they gather these discarded bottles and cans, either from the street or from um, bags of discard, and they bring them to redemption centers like ours to redeem for cash. So th that's sort of the, the world that we live in. There's lots of concepts and, and factors that uh, sort of shape and, and guide that world. You know, I mean, the, the social stigma that uh, pushes people into canning in the first place, um, whether it's on a personal level or a demographic level, um, a, a huge number of our canners are uh, non-English speakers, um, they may experience mental illness or they may experience homelessness, uh, circumstances that make it difficult for them to earn income in more conventional ways. Um, many even just uh, have gotten to a point in their life where they 
desire a different kind of independence or freedom. A lot of people find the work of canning liberating, or perhaps they're a member of a family um, that has other sources of income, but they might be older and they want to be, they want to work, they want to put their day to some activity. So they'll come and they'll collect cans and earn a little bit of extra income for their family. So it's a really a, a quite diverse, uh, in terms of experience and backgrounds, quite a diverse community, um, which also makes it hard to generalize very succinctly about them. Um, so really what our mission is focused on is providing, like you mentioned, a space for people who do this activity to do it in a way that supports, um, makes space for, is compassionate towards all the different experiences that draw them to that activity. And because here in New York, as I think we know in areas that are characterized by poverty, by um, extreme racial dynamics or social dynamics, uh, there's a lot of stigma and difficulty associated with that. So it's another part of our mission to raise this work out of uh, the area of like pressure, necessity, and difficulty, and into one that recognizes both the dignity of the activity, the labor itself, and also the good that they're doing for the community and for the planet. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, a little research I had done, I mean, I know that some facilities, some um, redemption facilities, there's lots of limitations on what time you can come and I know that it's it's become tough for for canners to, and you guys provide sort of a, 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 a an, e, an easier and more um, I'm trying to think of the word a, a better environment for sure than dropping it off at like a a grocery store or a, a, a drug store or a, another um, redemption center right is that correct Yeah well that's our aim and. Um... As sort of the landscape changes, the ways we act to pursue that aim might differ. I mean, for example, the center was founded by a group of canners who were experiencing homeless, homelessness at that time. You can see our uh, co-founder, Ana Martinez de Luco here, and our other co-founder, I think you have the slide, uh, Eugene mm -hmm. Gadsden. Um, they were experiencing homelessness at the time, Anna voluntarily and Eugene involuntarily. Um, and Anna was, she was working at the UN. She was looking for a way to bring her life to the people that she wanted to serve, you know, the communities that she knew needed it most. So she made this movement to become voluntarily homeless and took on the work of canning. She lived with the canners and she canned with them. Um, and soon became very attuned to this tremendous need in the community for exactly what you described. Uh, uh, consistency was, is a big part of it. At that time, even though the bottle bill, which was enacted in 1983, had been around for over 20 years, the services that were available to canners were extremely minimal. And there was a I think one redemption center in Manhattan at that time that had just closed, a place called We Can, a nonprofit like us. So that it ended up becoming um, the model for Sure We Can as it exists now, as far as uh, the scope of our mission beyond just the revenue from redemption, but really serving the community, advocating and, and providing services. Um, so this century closed, there weren't a lot of options. There, there were sort of trucks coming through Manhattan where canners could deliver, but there was a lot of inconsistency, fraud, people being ripped off, people being treated unfairly. You'd go to a grocery store, reverse vending machines where you can put the cans in one at a time and they would be out of order or, or you know, you can't put all your brands here. You've got to oh, maximum 60 cans, you know, these things that just, uh, when you're trying to make your living off of five cents per bottle and can uh, really make it difficult. So there was this tremendous need and Anna and Eugene led this group of canners to found their own space and um, pursue this new mission to serve the community. This began in Manhattan out of storage spaces and trucks itself. I mean, it didn't have a permanent location at first, but slowly, 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 um, 
it expanded and eventually was priced out of Manhattan, moved to Brooklyn, where we remain today. Uh, so we actually have a question uh, from Stefan. Um, he's asking, what if anything did, sure, we can learn from, we can. And, uh, and how, what were the reasons they wound up closing? If you know. They were priced out. They couldn't afford to oh. continue operating. Um, and I think what was learned, I guess, was just that, first of all, that redemption centers were possible. I think this community at the time did not, you know, didn't have the institutional knowledge to even know what, how they could empower themselves. Um, and also, again, I'll, I'll reinforce again, this sort of twofold aspect to the mission. Most redemption centers are for-profit organizations. Uh, sure We Can is the only nonprofit redemption center in New York City, like We Can was before. So this sense that not only was it possible to create a space that could be revenue generating and earn income for the canners, but also that it could be a sort of symbol and a outpost from which to start to build these ideas and these systems to create better lives for people. Um, and so in addition to recycling um, and providing a, a place for canners, there's a lot of other things that happen at Sure We Can. Like uh, I know art is a big part of it. Is that now how I, I know us talking before and uh, learning about you, you're a theater artist. So is that what brought you to this, uh, to Sure We Can or was that sort of? That's right. I, um, I work as a performer and theater artist and I was working with a company in which I still work with called Jechi. You can see a picture here. Um, this was actually taken just a couple of weeks ago when we were able to do a distanced and um, safe performance of our a piece that we've done for years at Sure We Can. Um, we were all tested before this picture was taken if you're worried about the lack of masks. Um, but yes, yeah, so I worked with this company, which I worked with for many years, and we work in this area of art as service. Um, what are the compassionate capacities of art? How can theater be a venue for community building and, and for disparate communities to find common ground? Um, and we are always on the lookout for interesting venues. And I think someone sent an email to our director to um, just pointing out, sure we can. And sort of on a whim, we came and we had a conversation with Anna. And from just from the very beginning, it was evident that even beyond the, the trappings of our work, there was a sense of shared mission and spirit that uh, was in, in really like a, a, a wonderful sense of alignment. So we started offering our performances at Sure We Can I became the liaison between the performance group and the space, which eventually when I was out of a job, it turned into um, work for me. And that was a couple years ago. And here we are now. But even beyond that, I think um, this, it, it comes back to this twofold aspect that we're not just here to give, like participate in the money functioning process of, of the recycling industry. You know, I mean, there, that's a part of it for sure, but that we also want to create space for these aspects of culture and a way of envisioning a culture that promote the values that we think reinforce the social economic piece of it, of like, how do we create a space that's really suffused with compassion, both in our business practices, in the things that happen there, in the opportunities that we offer to the community um, how do we expand our network of compassionate people? Like, how do we partner with uh, the people who are working in this vein, regardless of the, the industry or the place, the form that that work manifests in? Um, so it's always, always, always been a part of Sure We Can's mission to include artists, the people who are envisioning that new world um, in the space and in the work. Yeah. And even in the name of Sure We Can, there's sort of that compassion and that like we can do it whatever it is we exactly can, we can do it yeah together. exactly uh it it's really it's really beautiful um we have we have a question actually about about canners and how much so how much do canners receive for a can and i, I think there's sort of two answers which you guys have right you provide an extra sort of bonus right you want to talk about yeah, that sure the um 
the in New York, the deposit on every bottle and can is that's included in the deposit law, which is not every container, um, is five cents. So that's set by the law. So what we get as a redemption center is we. This is where it gets kind of wonky and, and complicated, but I'll try to be straightforward. So, as when the customer pays that five cents, that sort of goes into a account that's held by the state that then gets um, given back via the distributors who are the ones who like front the cost. It all kind of like gets pushed around advance wise, but the customer pays and then that five cents goes back to whoever redeems the container. We as a redemption center advance that money to the canners as they come. And then we are reimbursed for that advance by the distributors who pick up the bottles and cans that we collect, sort, count, and collate. So in addition to the five cents for every piece, the distributors also give us three and a half cents per piece for our operating costs. So that's where my salary comes from and the salary of our staff here. As a nonprofit, because our primary aim isn't just to increase our revenue, we also set aside a portion of those three and a half cents to offer to the canning community if they come in and do uh, sort for themselves, for example, they count and sort, that saves us some labor. We wanna make sure that uh, that goes back to the canner who did that work. So it's uh, at minimum five cents per piece that the canner would earn, uh, maximum they could get another one and a half cents per piece if they count and sort as well. Uh, so yeah, that's great. Um, can we, uh, let's also talk about, um, sorry, Brian. can you hear me? I'm sorry, I'm muted. I'm back, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and we're gonna, I know we're gonna see some of the the work out there, but um, this is, uh, the, is this where they sort? Is this the opportunity to sort the, the cans mm -hmm. and bottles? The, what you're seeing here is our warehouse sorting space. Uh, and yeah, like you mentioned, we'll see when we walk around as well. This is space that's dedicated for our, we have dedicated canner sorters. That is people who have been part of the community for many years. And because they have shown us a lot of trust and uh, earned a lot of trust from us, we've uh, set them up so that they can work at their leisure and essentially as much as they want to in dedicated space to just sort and count. Um, so they do, you know, they really make our job easier and they're able to get space to essentially work full time. Um, Alan asks, so realistically, how much do you think a canner can earn in a day? Uh, it's quite variable. Um, our canners who work the most will earn between 100 and 200 dollars a day. Um, but that they also are working like 12 hours a day, seven days a week collecting. I mean, it's a huge amount of labor. Um, some will come and earn just $5 in a day just from casually um, collecting. It's, it's very variable and it depends on the lifestyle and the interest of the individual canner. Uh, and gardening is, happens as well at Sure We Can, doesn't it? And that's, is that a... That's right, yes. Um, so since after the establishment of the Redemption Center, uh, let's say once we moved to Brooklyn in 2009 and got a little more settled here, we started to expand our view into what other, again, how we could move beyond just the logistical functions of canning into really envisioning a more sustainable, more compassionate, more socially responsible world. Um, so a big part of that has been gardening and composting. Uh, which are the scope of our program has varied over the years. But you can see right now this past year, uh, we had a lovely group of NYU students who received a grant to help build a garden, an urban garden as a part of a homelessness resiliency program that our co-founder Anna DeLuco just started this past year. So that was on site here at Sure We Can. Um, it's moving to its own location. It's now grown out of leaving the nest, so to speak. Um, but we will continue to have gardening here. Uh, we've, we once had a robust composting program here that was, we were processing a lot of compost on site. Um, that ended up being more labor and byproduct intensive than we could really 
handle. So we ha we've had to scale that down and we also didn't receive any more funding for it. So right now we simply operate as a compost drop-off site for the community. Um, I'm sure many of you, if you're interested in this stuff, are already aware that uh, DSNY stopped collecting organics on the onset of the pandemic. So there's other CBOs like uh, Big Reuse or Grow NYC that are sort of stepping into the gulf there to help organizations like ours that can serve as drop-off points or individuals like you all make sure that you're still able to sustainably dispose of your organics. So yeah, we, we're very um, eager to sort of expand our scope beyond just bottles and cans to really continue to turn the space into an example of what uh, we like to use the word circular community center, a, a place that's really dedicated to a, a, a new way of being that's not so attached to consumption and waste. And um, I mean, it's really one day at a time with that stuff, especially, I mean, the worm's kind of turning with the, the vocabulary. People are becoming more and more engaged with these ideas, I think. So we're, we're seeing a lot of potential, but uh, when it comes to getting funding when it comes to working out arrangements with the local government. That's a very step-by-step -step kind of process. So we take it one day at a time. Right. So that's actually a perfect segue to a question that we had uh, from Matthew. Um, do, you, do you handle uh, only deposit containers or are there other re recyclables that, um, that have value but are not under the deposit program that you guys are able to, to handle? Well, we have tried to branch out. Um, the, it does end up being to a degree a sort of cost benefit situation in the sense that um, we have a, a sustainable business model with the, the bottle and can redemption. Um, there's infrastructure that allows us to really do that work at volume. Um, however, we don't have the resources to do material collection of other types, say like scrap metal or cardboard or what have you. What we have tried to do is be creative, like, um, for example, with the single use plastic issue, which, which became a real, uh, really came to a head, I think, in, in New York City in the past year or so with the single use plastic ban finally coming through the council, um, though, again, the pandemic disrupted a lot of that. But what we tried to do in relation to that is we began a single use plastic upcycling program. And what that means is that we, we bought a heat press, which is like a clamshell machine that gets like a, has a hot plate on one side of it. And we began collecting single use plastic from the community and um, used our heat press to press all this unusable flimsy plastic into sheets of durable, nice, like almost leather-like plastic that we then sold to a local designer. And we've also used in our own efforts to just something more durable, reusable that could uh, transform this stuff that is a real plague in waste streams. I mean, single use plastic really gums up the works um, into something that had a new life and that could also be a source of creativity and uh, an artistic opportunity for those who are involved. It's, a, it's an exciting work and we're still engaged with it, but again, it's um, we're reliant on uh, don't, not donation, but like foundation grant funding to support that activity. Um, so especially in the face of the pandemic, it's been difficult to make, say, like, get it up to the scope, the, the, the level that we is easier with redemption because of that infrastructure. Um, and if there's uh, ways that people can help you guys, I mean, it, it, through your website, is that the, the best way for people to get involved and maybe make donations? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you can donate on the website. You can... Um, email us to volunteer. We're super happy. Obviously, again, the pandemic complicates. We used to have wonderful, you know, big crowds of people coming, but we can't do that right now. But um, individual volunteer opportunities we have. Um, there's, we've had issues with our landlords, which may be coming up again this coming spring in terms of trying to maintain this lot we have here. Um, so keep an eye out. There might be ways to write a letter or call you know, a council member uh, just to help us keep at it. You know, I mean, it's uh, we're talking about all these visions from the future and at a time where honestly it's uh, a challenge just to maintain what we have. So that's <laughs> we're trying to fo focus on both at the same time. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so, um, so a few more questions before we, we get out there. Ryan's going to give us a, a little tour of the facility and we'll actually see where all this stuff uh, goes on. Um, so Alan asks, um, how many cans can there be in a given neighborhood, do you think? And is, is there competition between the canners to acquire large amounts every day? Is there sort of like, I don't know, turfs, like areas that are, how does that work? Yeah, I don't know how much like active competition is. I think mostly people end up settling themselves. And let's be real and say that there's enough waste in New York for everybody. Um, I think that's the truth. But we do see, I mean, especially those who work at a higher volume, that they have their relationships and their routes. I think people um, picking up off the street and more people developing relationships with superintendents, with restaurants, with individuals who are providing them these large, like setting aside things from their business and then providing them to the canners at li larger volumes. Um, and uh, as far as like the volume that is actually available, um, it's it's a little hard to tell since we don't know exactly where the volume of process is coming from. But we do know that sure we can operates on a hyper local level, for example, uh, or the reason we know that it's actually illegal in New York to do canning with a motor vehicle. So everything that's brought to us is brought to us on foot. Um, people in with, you know, garbage, not garbage, with uh, shopping carts, etc. So um, at our peak, which was last year before the onset of the pandemic, we were processing over a million containers every month. So that's all from East Williamsburg, Bushwick. And do you, do you have a sense about how many uh, people come to the uh, shore we can? I mean, how many, I don't, members or like mm -hmm. uh, how, what the word is? Last year, we had over 900 individuals come to Sure We Can. Again, this year's like totally thrown our metrics off, so it's hard to really gauge uh, based on this year. But yeah, like uh, 900 individuals last year and around 100, 150 people who come once a week. Wow. So a good amount of people. Yeah. Um, some other questions uh, from Cindy. Are there a lot of regulations like the one you mentioned about the motor vehicle, are there other regulations like that that have an impact on canners? And is there yes. much enforcement of that? Well, I mean, it's funny. I, I ride my bike a lot in New York. So if there's other cyclists on here, you may relate to how um, it seems like the NYPD will just enforce bicycle rules when it pleases them to do so. Um, and we see a lot of a similar type of vibe with the canners in the sense that for example, anything that gets set out on the curb for DSNY becomes technically DSNY property, city property. So if a canner is going through those bags, technically that's, uh, they're illegal, right? They're um, taking property that belongs to the city. And the city is invested in receiving that material because the corporation, Sims, that has a 20 year long contract, which were 10 years through with New York City to process all of their redemption, uh, uh, residential recycling. Um, if bottles and cans, especially cans get taken out of those bags and taken to our center, that's raw material, aluminum that Sims can't resell. So it's their opinion. And because of this exclusive contract with the city, it ends up being New York City's opinion as well by default that anything that the canners remove from the waste stream impacts their bottom line. Um, so again, it just becomes, it's also kind of gray in the sense that this is like a policy from the corporation that ends up becoming de facto city policy that's not really reflected in the law, but sanitation has a regulation. I mean, da 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 da. It gets like really a gray area in terms of legality, which essentially just creates a situation where. Um, on the enforcement side, uh, people can pick and choose. So you're not only dealing with the law, but also all these factors of stigma, um, social, racial bias, I mean, lack of shared language, these issues that make it very difficult for a canner, for example, to stand up for themselves in a situation where they might be confronted by a uh, DSNY or a law enforcement officer, regardless of the actual legality of, of what they're doing. Um, 
So it, the, the murkiness of it all creates a sort of exploitable context, unfortunately. I wouldn't say we see it like endemic, like most of our canners aren't talking about always being hassled, but it does happen. Yeah, and Cindy pointed out that it, it's a, it's, we see a similar issue with the street vendors. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, and there's a complex web of, uh, you know, different organizations and agencies uh, that make it difficult and, and enforcement is, is often discretionary as Cindy, Cindy put it. Right. Yeah. And when, um, I mean, similar to the street vendors, right? When people are already in a position to be institutionally averse or afraid, it just, um, they're not in a position to even exercise their rights, much less, or to know their rights, much less exercise them. Right. Um, and before we get out there, one more question, and then with the questions, please keep them coming. And I think when we see uh, the facility, more questions will probably just naturally come up. But um, Cindy asked about, about the pandemic and how the canners are doing during this time. And, uh, and uh, imagine most of these people have not received any sort of assistance. From, That's right. Or, yeah. That's right. Um, though I think <laughs> it's a funny thing. I mean, you're absolutely right. And most people in our community have not received any kind of assistance. Um, and yet, weirdly, we, we work in this sort of recession-proof industry, right? In the sense that the waste continues. Um, the biggest impact, I would say, is the closure of bars and restaurants has resulted in a decrease of, of volume, which is somewhat made up for by an increase on the residential side. But again, that creates these issues with uh, DSNY and SIMS because the residential, wa residential waste stream is where the city's real investment comes in. Um, but by the same, but again, like, uh, and we have seen, there's some people who we haven't seen since the beginning of the pandemic. We can say that we don't know what's happened to them. Uh, community members who we had relationships with, um, but maybe didn't have a way to get in touch with, uh, who've, who've just vanished. However, we've been able to keep on and we found that not only are the canners extremely resilient because of you know years and years of hardship and uh, difficulty it's not like struggling to survive is anything new um but we've also seen that the canners are um i'm sorry i lost my train of thought here that <sighs> sorry i forgot i lost my train of thought sorry. well you know i think it'd be good to get out there there's some some questions and comments coming in, but maybe we, I know you've got your phone that you're gonna yep. connect to. Um, and uh, there's been some talk about the economics of this. And Alan uh, noted that 2000 cans can earn a hundred dollars, which is an amazing amount of work in one day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I'm just reading through the, the comments here. Oh, and the question about, do you count physically every can from the canner? Yes, we do. We have someone who's uh, on staff whose job it is to receive every canner and, and verify the count. That's amazing. Um, well, let's let's get out there. We've got about a little under 20 minutes or so um, to, to, to get out there and see how things are going. I know you've got to mask up, of course. And um, But if, yeah, please, if there's any other questions, I know Stefan is working on putting together Alan's uh, 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 details um, in terms of the uh, economics of this. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, uh, to see this both as an economic uh, standpoint and what an incredible um, uh, thing they're doing for the environment. I mean, these these cans and bottles are ones that are end up in the trash that don't get recycled elsewhere. So it, it's really uh, an incredible thing that they're doing. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, we're gonna spotlight Ryan's video um, and, um, uh, I think we've got the phone turned on and yes. Yeah, can, can you hear and see me here? Can you hear we me? Can. Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. Um, oh, could you, there you go. Perfect. I was going to ask All you right. sideways and you're going to kind of walk us through sort of uh, from maybe the entrance of sure we can. And that's right. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of walk the path that a canner would walk uh, through sure we can. Well, give me a second to get out there. Of course. Marlon, yep. my man. Give me just a second, we'll come back and chat, right? Okay. And please, if anyone else has any other questions, these questions are great. Please keep them coming. Um, 
and you saw lots of that that art all about um, the 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 murals and stuff. Are they done by specific artists? How does that work? The the artwork all around. Did you hear me, Ryan? Um, can you hear me? We can. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so I, I'm not going to stray too far forward because it looked like the the my signal was breaking down. But you can actually see here we've got a Pepsi truck coming up. So uh, this truck is going to get loaded, or they're just taking off. Maybe they finish. Um, that truck is full of bottles and cans, or it's going to be up here. You can see. Oh yeah, we're breaking up a little bit. I think. So those are Pepsi. That'll get a truck. I see about the art. Try to get closer to the, but the art's been done here over many years. Many different artists. We had a residential, a resident rather, uh, graffiti artist for a little while, but that was way before my time, maybe uh, six or seven years ago. So here's the entrance. When the canner comes in, they come through this space. You can see people working here now. Bathrooms up there. Well, we can. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Ryan, uh, we had a question about, um, do you take all cans or are you similar to the grocery store? You can only take um, what they sell. Or so we, we take anything that has the five cent deposit on it that we can um, then return to the distributors. So it's dependent on whether we can find and make contact with the distributor in order to set up pickups. So we take more than the grocery stores do, but there's still a limit if we're not able to make that connection. So here you can see, I'm gonna speak up because it's a little noisy out here. No problem, yep. But here you can see the space where the canners do their work. So previous to the pandemic, there was a lot more hustle and bustle here, but even so we've got quite a bit of activity. Um, this is another part of what makes Sir We Can unique compared to other redemption centers, which is that most other redemption centers just are a storefront with only internal storage space. So us making sure there's space here for the canners to do their work, to interact with each other, to share time, conversations, stories, um, to trade materials if they like. Um, it's really a special thing. I mean, you can see people interacting who don't speak the same language, who have no shared sense of history, but really uh, come together through this activity and uh, just by being in space together. So we're really proud of the consequences of, of making this available. This is where the canners will count and sort if they wanna earn that extra piece of the handling fee for themselves. Um, if they don't, then we'll come to this, to the warehouse. So this is the space you saw from the other side in that photo. Tarsisu here is uh, creating um, pallets of glass. So all of these are glass bottles that have been returned. In the back, you can't really see it here, but uh, the lower levels for cans and the upper levels for water bottles. Mm -hmm. So all of the sorting that we do ourselves happens in space. Once it's all sorted, either by the canner or by our staff, the bags move to our storage area, which is kind of crazy right now because of the snow. But you can see here our storage space. We're waiting on some pickups, so we're a little over full right now. But um, each of the containers is dedicated to a distributor. So this is where it gets wonky again. So for example, um, with a Corona bottle of beer, it's not Corona who comes to pick it up. It's Manhattan Beer, the distributor that also picks up Coors, also picks up Tecate, other brands. Um, so we have to work with the distributors to know what brands they accept because no distributor wants to accept brands that they don't distribute. And also the manner that we do the return. So the distributors dictate what brands go in the bags, how many bottles, per bag, per size. So you can see here, we've got this bag of uh, 16 ounce Poland Spring. 
and then this bag of one liter Coca-Cola, they both have different uh, rules as far as how many uh, containers need to go in this bag versus this bag. And also you can see here that it's not just Coca-Cola, but Sprite. Um, right. I just see Coke and Dasani in there. So all of Coke's brands go in one bag, all of Pepsi's brands go in another bag. And this is Nestle that does Poland Spring and San Pellegrino. Caitlin uh, has a question. Do the cans have to retain their shape in order to be recycled or can they be crushed? Will crushed cans recycle? Uh, no, they can't be completely crushed. I think there's a little bit of leeway. I mean, we do throw the bags around. Um, so it's not like they need to be pristine, but they, we, they can't be like flattened. Hmm. It's good to know. Um, and um, Alan was asking, Alan, uh, great with the numbers here. <laughs> um, he was figuring out a million cans a month at a profit of 31 uh, and a half cents. A can is $3,500 a month for you guys. So that's, do you, you must also receive grants. I know you mentioned some grants earlier. Um, is there other funding that you guys are able to receive as well? Um, yes, well, what we've been lucky enough to get uh, some wonderful help this year, which we which we really needed. And um, we were, we did, most of our grants come from the advocacy side rather than the redemption side. Um, I'm gonna go back inside now so we can talk more clearly. Does that make sense? Yeah, do we have, I, I see there's a few other questions coming through, but. Yeah, maybe um, any questions about while I'm outside about what's going on out here? Yeah, I don't, we, we, someone asked about the bottle caps. Are bottle caps supposed to be included with the recycling? They are supposed to be included, yes. They are. Okay, good to know. Um, yeah, and we're not, we're not going over to the gardening or composting area. There's not much to see right now because of the snow, of course. That's right, that's um, all back here. Oh, I saw the question. It is okay if they're not included, but they, ideally, yes. Uh -huh. That's the garden is back there. I mean, it's nothing to see right now. Of course, yeah. Well, this was this was amazing to see some some of the canners working and 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 you guys. I'm sorry if if you mentioned this earlier, but what are your the hours? I mean, how early can canners come and how late can they stay? Oh, we might have lost Ryan for a moment. Uh, Been from to five p.m. to one on Saturdays. Um, just to give you a, sen a sense of, oh, sorry about that. You lost, um, can you hear me? I, we can hear you now. Yeah, I, uh, I think we lost you for a moment, but we're, okay. we're back, which is great. Um, we're open from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays and 7.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturdays. Okay. And um, just to give you a sense of scale, if you can see back, back up here, all these are Poland spring bottles. Also these, we could accumulate about that much in a, uh, less than two weeks. So that's a sense of how often that uh, we're turning over these materials and the scale of our um, deliveries and pickups. Wow. So I'm gonna go back inside now. Great. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you can sort of talk as, as you walk or if you'd rather just wait till we get back inside. But we had a few other questions. Um, so uh, Cindy, it asked, um, what's sort of the long-term vision for the organization? Uh, I know you said there's lots of different avenues and uh, that you're thinking about. Maybe we'll wait till. Well, okay. Um, let me answer that question in just a second. I've also got a canner here who um, we can chat with for a moment. Oh, oh, amazing. Great. Um, I, I want to answer those questions. I just want to, I don't want to take too much of Marlon's time. So uh, I just want to oh, introduce yeah, you a, amazing. my friend Marlon here. Hey, Marlon, how you doing? Okay. Just a little tired from last night. Yeah. Were you, uh, yeah. So it, were you collecting last night and then redeeming today? Mm -hmm. Is that? No, 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 no. Um, my, well, for my nieces, my niece, um, Shamara and my niece-in-law, uh, Patricia, they were party for their, um, the father, Julius Sr., mm -hmm. and the, Julius Jr., the son. So oh. my birthday is this week. Well, man, how, oh, how wow, often you can? Birthday. How often you go out to can? 
Um, I'm looking at them six days a week. Six days a week. And how many and, hours do you spend canning about? You mean in the morning? Yeah, when you go out for the day. Um, usually... About eight. Wow. That's a lot. You still in the morning? I'd say like maybe 5, 36. And, and do you always go to the same spot to collect cans or the same neighborhood? Yeah, same neighborhood. Always the same, yeah. yeah. Same neighborhood. And how long have you been uh, coming to Sure We Can to redeem? Oh, my buddy, yeah, now. Yeah. And before then, I guess there were other redemption centers that you'd... Right, right, it's uh, Flushing and Porter. Uh, okay. I'm star. There's another space uh, relatively close by down on Flushing called Blue Star. Okay. Yeah. And so what makes you come to Sure We Can versus other places? Sure, sure We Can is uh, more efficient and convenient. It's faster. Because sometimes when I go over there to see Jose, it's like a lot of people, like 20, 30 people in the morning waiting. Like, I don't know, they must get there about 7, 7.30, and it yeah. opens at 9 o'clock. A lot of people out there. Meetings and stuff, you've been coming to those a lot. Meetings? Yeah, the meetings good. Yeah, I mean, you want to tell them maybe a little bit about the meetings? Um, I'm trying to remember that word. <laughs> EPR, is that EPR. Yeah, because I'm last night, I went to sleep late. <laughs> EPR. Um, talking about the EPR, uh, prison night, and trying to get the people to be able to see the put the cannons in that in a in the same spotlight as uh, the different businesses, but they don't see it like that. Some lady, I don't know the lady's name. From sanitation, right? She doesn't yeah. see. Recyclers as uh, relevant to, uh, to to the to the recycling issues at hand. Went to a, a meeting at the a, a digital meeting at the Brooklyn Swab, the Solid Waste Advisory Board on extended producer responsibility legislation. And our aim has been to make sure that the canners' voices can get included, but uh, it's a it's a major process. We're, we're encountering some obstacles. Yeah. Like very different. Like she's very. Uh, I say set in a ways is, I guess that's a better way to put it. Or, yeah. I'm gonna say difficult, because then it's like, well, <laughs> yeah. maybe somebody could help convince her to be the can as a solution to the recycling needs of the city. Absolutely. So that's what I took away from uh, Thursday night, the meeting. Yeah. yeah. And there were quite a few canners present at the meeting, I guess. Um, we had four canners there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah, Marlon, thank you uh, so much. I'm just looking in the chat to see if there's any. Uh, someone asked about how many hours go into work each day, but I think you mentioned about eight hours, six days a week. So that's that's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. A lot of. Different. Well, I already have my set route. It was Tompkins, Sumner. I don't go with, like near Marcy, but I'm in because I figure somebody else is down on that side of the street. They were asking earlier, do you, do you end up uh, feeling like there's like turf, like places you can't go to can? Really? No, not a lot of competition. That's good. I mean, before, but now I don't honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't see any competition really. Interesting. When did that change? Last year, I didn't see too much. Mm -hmm. You know, before that time, it used to be a lot. And someone asked um, if there's certain times of year that is better to yeah. can than others. Uh, maybe is there a more, yeah. a more profitable time of year? No, 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 I don't see it like that. Okay. People always have. Everybody's, because somebody always drinking beer, or somebody always drinking a soda or water. So maybe you have but of course, you have to be outside during this. So I right. do you prefer the winter or the summer. I know both are pretty brutal yeah. in New York. No, no matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just, yeah. No, I'm, I'm always out there. 
you just have the right clothing on and that's right just gotta be at it as with the right gear to, to start working yeah prepare for the weather well marlon thank you so much for for, for taking <laughs> a few minutes to chat with us um yeah people are are, are learning uh, your story and others and what sure we can does and the amazing work yeah. they do there so so yeah, thank you yeah. really for my story okay thanks marlon thanks man. okay <laughs> Um, so we have just a, a few, we have just a few more minutes, and I know there's there's some questions that we uh, we had. We we dropped the website for sure. We can again into the chat here, and uh, and we'll have some follow ups in an email. But um, yeah, Cindy wants to talk. Um, is one is it, can we talk to our council members in any way to help support the canners and the community? And and is there a particular campaign that they're working on that we should? Well, like uh, Marlon and I were talking about, there this buzzword of uh, extended producer responsibility is becoming more talked about in legislative circles. Um, it's basically the theory that those who um, are producing the materials that are causing waste issues, like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, whatever, since they're the ones that are making the plastic, that they should be the ones responsible for its, uh, you know, sustainable disposal. So there's a lot of talk in legislative circles about how, like what's the system that makes that possible. There's some examples around the world. In Canada and Europe, they have a lot of EPR structures. Um, so what we're really engaged in now is making sure that the canners, the people who do this work on you know, the, the grassroots level, so to speak, are being included in the conversation that they're as stakeholders, the sense that they're already participating in this work. The bottle bill is the only extant extended producer responsibility law in New York, um, for example. And it's extended. So they're already engaged. Say that again. The extended producer responsibility. EPR, okay. So the notion is that the producer, so that's the manufacturer, the person who makes the plastic, their responsibility for the product extends beyond uh, its sale. So they're responsible for it all the way through its lifespan. Right. Um, so yeah, just if to call your council members, to call uh, your state senators, your, uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff is happening on, on the state level. So assembly people and um, state senators are gonna be important to reach out to as well and say that you, it's vital that canners and waste pickers be included in these conversations so that these systems aren't created without considering their needs, which is what's happening. Yeah. Um, and um, and other ways, again, you mentioned to go to the website and mm -hmm. they can donate to Sure We Can. And, and, and there are grants that you guys have received or in the process of receiving. Or... Yes, right. I was going to mention yeah. um, this year we had the wonderful opportunity to help advocate into the Canner community to um, increase the count, you know, uh, get out the count for the US Census, which was obviously complicated by the pandemic, um, but we were still able to contribute to an overall rise in New York City's census participation. So we were really pleased with that. Um, and then right now we've received funding from New York City Health and Hospitals to do COVID outreach messaging. So we're distributing face coverings. We're uh, making sure that COVID responsible messaging gets out into the community. We're going to be part of uh, the vaccine messaging and making sure that uh, our community is well informed and has all they need to make sure that they can stay healthy and safe. So we've been, we've been privileged to receive those kind of, that kind of help and also it's a privilege to be able to do that sort of outreach and increase our community's capacity to be safe and represented. And I think for the last question, Cindy is asking again, long term, if you're able to mm. receive more funding, what do you hope to achieve? Well, we're really engaged with this concept of the circular community center. So we wanna integrate all of our programs into, again, it, it's really about making the space as it's always been, right? So from the beginning, the sense that it's not just about the activity, but creating the space where culture, con uh, connectivity, community can blossom, you know, values can be discussed, shared, learned about, I mean, 
So we want to continue to expand our garden, uh, make space for redemption, make more space for art, more space for repair and upcycling, and integrate these all together, hopefully under economic models that are going to support people, like give people real livelihood, healthcare, access to social support that they've never received. Um, a more deepening our programs while also intertwining them into a more holistic vision of a more sustainable culture. It's amazing. It really is a great vision as Alan just posted in the, uh, in the chat here. So, um, well, Ryan, this has been, this has been really, really amazing uh, to learn about the, such the important work you guys are doing to help the community and the, the earth and uh, so much stuff. So it, it, it really, thank you so much. And, uh, I, everyone, please check out sureweekend.org, uh, get involved, write to your council members uh, as well. And, um, and yeah, and, and thank you all for making this possible for us as well at Turnstile Tours to keep these programs running and, and telling these important stories uh, th that we've been doing like, like with Sure We Can. Uh, so again, Ryan, thanks again. I enjoy the rest of your week and, uh, and thank you all. And I hope to see you again. Oh. Uh, I guess uh, Merry Christmas for those that celebrate. Happy holidays. We'll be back after uh, Christmas with our next program. So again, turnstiletours.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy holidays. Thanks so much. Thanks Take so care, much everyone. for having me. Happy holidays. Take care. Bye-bye.